Hey listeners, Eliza and I are heading to Las Vegas to work on a week of episodes exploring the city's exciting food and drink scene. But first, we wanted to ask you, do you have a favorite restaurant or bar or want to tell us about an underrated gem that we must visit? We'd love to hear about your Las Vegas spots. Write us at hello at tastecooking.com to share. And we look forward to bringing you these special episodes in early June. We really think European butter from France is the best butter. And our friend, the expert baker and best-selling cookbook author David Leibovitz agrees. Check out our recent episode with David to find out how he cooks with quality butter. And for recipes, tips, and cooking advice, go to tasteeurope.com. I think I wanted to create a moment where the idea of coming together, building something out of a community could shine through, even if it's not fully realized in the end, and if in the end it is not possible, because it mostly isn't. This is Taste. I'm your host, Eliza Barbanel. Selina Baljeet Basra is the Berlin-based author of Happy, a sweet and surreal postmodern novel released last year. It follows a young man named Happy from his family cabbage farm in Punjab to his clandestine journey to Europe and the food service jobs he works along the way. I've never read a book quite like Happy, and it's so fun to have Selina on the show to talk about untraditional food writing, her favorite restaurants in Berlin, and more. Selena Baljeet Basra, this is Taste. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so happy to talk to you today. <laughs> I'm so happy whenever I get to talk to a novelist about their book because it's like the ultimate two-person book club um, where I can just find out <laughs> all of the answers instead of just speculating about things. And Happy is one of my favorite books that I've read in a while. I can't say I've read anything quite like it before. Oh my God, thank you so much. <laughs> Always feels so good to hear things like these. Yeah, I would imagine after spending a lot of time writing something, especially a book <laughs> that plays with format in so many different ways, that it's it's gratifying to hear that. And I guess to start, I'm curious to know about how food literally fuels your writing. Do you have any favorite writing snacks or meals that you turn to? Oh, for sure. My best writing window um, is usually in the early morning, the first rush of coffee, However, sandwiches are important and luckily my partner works in food and when I was writing Happy, it was partly during the pandemic. He started a little picnic catering mainly for friends and friends of friends and I got to be the guinea pig for the dishes, mostly uh, schnitten, which is basically a German word for sandwich, which you can also use if you think if you find a person hot schnitte <laughs> so that's what he does like sandwiches open sandwiches and uh yeah that was lovely also there was a place just opposite our past apartment called Barra, and it's um actually pretty fancy but they did a fried chicken sandwich at the time for lunch and that was just perfect so yeah coffee and sandwiches i love that i can imagine sandwiches <laughs> are good because you can kind of commit to them with both hands and then be done with them. I find that I like to eat, you know, grapes or, or popcorn or kind of like small bites as motivation when I'm working on something. <laughs> That's great too. I want to know a little more about this this sandwich business because you're you're based in Berlin and I think that when I think about Berlin in the summer, it's a lot of picnicking that's involved. I'm curious if you have a, a favorite sandwich that's on the lineup right now. Oh, you know, um, I think the sandwiches I loved are mostly not done anymore. There was a time during the pandemic, probably happened in New York too, when really good food places did a sort of cheaper sandwich for lunch because they were closed, but they could do takeaway. So there was really a renaissance of the lovely sandwich at the time. And I was lucky. It was just during the time I was writing happy. And yes, um, my partner, he's called Bjorn. And he does a sort of catering, a little catering business called Zuff and Snack. And so he does drinks and sandwiches. Um, but right now, I love the sandwiches at Love Deluxe. It's a sort of 
It's a brunch place, uh, relatively new, one year old, just turned one year. Uh, it's called by, it's done by Adelina and Bayou, and they do sort of foods from their childhood in Australia and American Thals, and they make lovely sandwiches, always this home-cooked feel to them. So I love going there right now. Um, and it's named after the study song, I uh, love to lick. And to be like my, my daughter, um, Ever since she was born, she has been falling asleep to Paradise by Shadi. So Shadi has a special, a, a sort of special place in our hearts right now. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I feel like Shadi is my go-to cooking music sometimes because it's like a chill enough vibe that I don't feel frazzled, but it also has the momentum for myself. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> it's perfect for cooking. So can you tell me where did the idea for your book Happy come from and how did it kind of develop as you were working on it? Yeah, it did percolate for quite some time. Um, in fact, I think I was a teenager when I first had an idea uh, for Happy and I've been trying to write this story for many years, like actually almost 20 years. Um, so I have many sort of hopeful beginnings, start away on old hard drives and there have been many sort of iterations Sometimes I've just been finishing Virginia with the waves, so it was quite nature, you know, based on uh, observations of nature and a bit more melancholy. And um, so they had, I tried out many different angles. And only when I wrote the prologue, the letter of application, um, so Happy's letter of application to be a shepherd in Sardinia, I sort of found his voice and I tapped into his voice. And then I sort of found a way to, to write the book finally to try to walk in his shoes, although I couldn't. And the, the event itself, um, and I don't want to spoil, but um, are we allowed to spoil? <laughs> yeah, I, I think we can uh, I think we can spoil at least a little bit. <laughs> yeah, okay. So it was sort of based on an event in my extended family, uh, an uncle of mine who passed away uh, while working as a shepherd in Italy. And my father had a few sort of relatives and friends from his village who came to Italy, not by the books, and worked in the food industry, in the leather industry, in the milk, cow, um, sort of food industry to make grand padano cheese or a shepherd uh, in that case. And so this death, where the causes of death were never determined, um, it was something that as a kid, I, I couldn't quite shake off. I wanted to solve this mystery. I wanted to understand in a way. So it's it's a way of trying to understand something which as a kid to me was so unfathomable. So um, yeah, that was the sort of origin of the first idea for Happy. But then it sort of changed form, of course. I studied art history, I worked in the arts, um, I, I traveled. So all of this a sort of universe of cons a sort of a constellation of references went into it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's really evident just from reading it because there are so many different perspectives that the book is written from and also Happy has so many different jobs in the food service industry, so to speak. He starts out as a cabbage farmer in India. He becomes a server in an Italian fried fish restaurant. He becomes a radish farmer in Europe. How did you approach the research for all of those different sections in the book? Yeah, as I said, connecting to the origin of the story, um, there were tales of things I heard from these jobs. Um, my father is from Punjab and um, he, at that point, that was in the 90s when it happened, had been living in, in Germany for quite some time. And he also had many different jobs. He worked at a factory as a gardener, a taxi driver by night. He helped out his brother who owned an Italian restaurant called Presto Presto. Um, Great and name. For a year, <laughs> amazing name. And for a year, he also tried his luck with an Indian fast food place called Masala, which failed like miserably. It was one of those places because I think he tried to copy how other Indian food places at the time did it, which weren't like really very good, as I would say now, because they all, I mean, they also serve pizza, they serve fries, sort of, you know. And um, I think they always use the same menu of things <laughs> so yeah it was always empty and still when I'm in my hometown I think it's now a mobile phone shop 
it's close to the train station, the Cedrus train station. It's still so sad because I love the optimism of opening this food place and I love doing the phone service because we did delivery too. Um, so yeah, that was the part of it was really just my life, my family. And then of course, lots of research and being in Italy, sort of seeing how, who worked at these restaurants in the back of the kitchens and then researching lots and lots of research and talking to people. Um, and it's been an interest of mine for quite some time, the politics of work, particularly in the food industry, also my curatorial work. So all of that sort of uh, came into the book. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I found the Italy chapters to be particularly interesting because, as you said, there is this kind of dynamic between who is working in the back of the restaurant and then who is the face of the restaurant. And I think certainly a place like Italy that's so known for their cultural cuisine and it's such a point of pride and, and happy who so desperately just wants to be a part of, of all of it, but who, you know, his optimism is kind of always being attempted to be tempted, tempered by the situation that he's in and he still kind of is persevering through all of that. How did you think about writing like an eternally optimistic character who is faced with settings that maybe are in conflict with his outlook on the world? Yeah, that's interesting. It was never because I wanted to make it, like, make these bleak conditions and sort of uh, topics lighter for me or the reader, but it was sort of looking at a psyche and a personality who's looking for the light whenever it can. Also how we tend to sort of repress bad stuff, how we get used as human beings, get used to really the worst of living conditions. You get used to so much and it was just, yeah, looking at someone who puts on a happy, you know, you literally working in the service industries, you do have to put on a happy face, but um, also not facing what's, what's, what's really happening for a long time. But that's also just a survival strategy. I sort of, for me, I always argue that you may, you're allowed to, you're allowed to, and to be an escapist and to disappear in stories. I think... Someone once told my mother, I read too much as a child and I don't live as in the real world. But I think it's okay to do that as a survival mechanism for a while, at least. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And I think, um, you know, some of it is escapist and some of it is, I think, him romanticizing things around him in the world that are worth being romanticized. It's, it's, it's special to be able to look at things in those kinds of eyes. And I feel like your book also is kind of romanticizing interesting things. There's like a whole section that's written like from the perspective of being a puff of cotton candy. How do you approach like getting in the head of, of a food or something that's an inanimate object? Like in India, at any beach or in front of the cinemas, um, there, like there's an omnipresence of these cotton candies that are packaged in plastic and are sort of... Oh, arranged in a big balloon form and someone is holding them up on a stick um, and it's very present in the sort of urban like if you look around in cities and I wanted to look at a real cotton candy maker and to be honest to have these different voices that uh, may be you know food talking or a tree or an object uh, it's just part of the idea that happy or the story of happy could only be told in a scattered way and by including many different voices. Um, because, I, because I did grapple with a question how I could write a story that was in a way set close to me, close to my heart, but not, I, I, didn't, I didn't experience the story, I didn't walk in his shoes, but how could I, you know? So I was always very hesitant, but this helped me sort of to allow myself to have the story reflected from all these voices, all these things and... It was just lots of fun too, to be honest. I think you create these energy stations for you as a writer to keep going, like the things that are just so much fun to write that, you know, and they keep you going. <laughs> so the food writing from the perspective of food was definitely uh, some of this. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I feel like reading this book, I just got the distinct impression that you love to eat um, just by the food writing and <laughs> how... Um, how often it appears and how like well it's done. What like food moment in the book do you most want to eat right now? Mm, it will always be the sugar rotis. 
because it's like it's not something you get in a restaurant uh even the good ones that have like home cooked style food or because it's a thing you make at home and it's a children's food it's you know it's also so cheap to make and i remember my my father taught sort of taught my german mother how to cook basic punjabi stuff and food and rotis and a sugar roti is basically just a sugary a sugar filled parata and um so when you you have it like if, especially if it's still warm with yogurt like cold yogurt and it's uh it's uh, i would always go for the sugar rotis yeah i think that was my first thing that i was reading in the book that made me so hungry <laughs> while i was reading <laughs> uh i love the idea of eating them with with cold yogurt that sounds like a really nice flavor texture contrast. I think the other one that I really wanted to eat was the Montarne. Is it a deep fried pizza that he's eating eating in Naples? Yeah, it is. It, it, he's eating it in Rome, but it's. A, I think it's more from Naples from the south, but it's, yeah, that's amazing. It's my partner, when we traveled to Italy, whenever he just loved it so much and it sort of stayed with me. I love it too, but it's like, wow, it really, it's very heavy, but it's amazing. Just um, like a donut tea deep fried pizza and it's also cheap so I always was thinking about things that happy can eat right that are not expensive and you know make you are good if you're hungry and keep you satisfied for a while and this is definitely one of those foods a Montanara. Yeah definitely I remember in the book he is talking describing it and I love how he's saying, like, as a Punjabi who eats so much fried food, he's so impressed with the level of how deep fried <laughs> this is. Uh, and also it kind of fits into his Italian fantasy that he has this moment when he's walking to work in the morning and he can stop and buy something with all of the other locals and feel like he has made it to Europe before he goes and, and works his job in this restaurant. I felt like it symbolized so much and also just sounded like such a um a hefty and intimidating breakfast for someone to have oh yeah like a purchase in a country that you've never visited before it does make you feel so proud especially if you practice a little sentence before like maybe you practice a little bit of italian and you you order your first food and everybody can and relate to that, but for him in particular, it makes you come into existence in a way, right? If you, I mean, that's a bad thing about capitalism that we think we are what we <laughs> buy, but in that case, it's like, it's, you know, he purchasing something to eat and feeling like the locals and having your little place that you return to. Um, that's something so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I remember when I was in Paris last summer rehearsing how to order my coffee and croissant in the street <laughs> for like five minutes. And then, of course, they switched to English as soon as of I did course. it. But I, you know, when <laughs> I was ordering, I felt like I had a beret on my head and that I was like totally Parisian in that moment. I do think it's like... Um, you know, that's the other side of food service is that it's your way of interacting with people that live in a place and kind of practicing an element of of what it feels like to spend time somewhere. Of course. That's so beautiful about it. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, so I know we're talking a little bit about the food writing you've done in the book. I find myself always very interested in kind of unconventional food writing or food writing that's being done by fiction writers, people like outside of just the food media industry. What do you think is the secret to good food writing? Oh, wow. That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, if you truly love something, true love and adoration helps maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and and not discriminating. If I, I love it if people can write beautifully about really mundane food. Um, recently, I had to write a short text about Tutensuppe, like instant soup and the feeling of a childhood where, you know, you didn't only have like good or elevated or fancy foods or, um, but you can have an emotional connection to any kind of food. You know, we all know that. Um, and yeah, I feel in general, it's interesting because I've been thinking about also like bad reviews of, uh, <laughs> of a book or a dish or a restaurant. I, I feel like Everything, you know, you, even that is done better if you know how to love something, like really love something too. Mm. And otherwise it gets all like so cold and airless. And so, yeah, I don't know. Do you it's happen really... to be thinking of the Lauren Euler book forum review by chance? Uh, no, <laughs> not at all. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, we don't need to get into that. But I do think there is an art to criticism that is grounded from the perspective of, of wanting something to be good or having good, you know, things that you're comparing 
something too. It is kind of sometimes satisfying to read a, a critical review if it's done well, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And if there's also those both like love and generosity, and then there can be harsh critique too. But yeah, I don't know. It must be grounded in something. Uh, so yeah, but I don't I don't know the secret to good food writing. But I always love it if it, I encounter it uh, by surprise and by people who are maybe not food food writers, but you know, who just describe something so beautifully. And yeah. I'm definitely better at writing it and describing it. I'm not so sure, but in, in writing, it sort of, you know, comes alive in a different way. I think the emotional connection that you're talking about is what is so special sometimes in food writing. If it is talking about how it makes you feel like not just using the word delicious, right, but the emotions that are coming up for you or the memories that are associated with it. Something that I love that you did in Happy is that you talked about memory in the context of the library of good smells um, that Happy has in his <laughs> mind, which I thought was was so sweet. And I'm curious, what would be in your library of good smells? I love scents. Scents are so important to me. And of course, we all know the connection of scents and memory, how they can bring something back in an instant. And it's been written about a lot. But And also, in as you know, a curator, I work with olfactory artists because it's so great to create spaces, right? We all know walking into Aesop or any sort of store that uses scent as well, or you can create a space. So, but I also like the memories of, of maybe smells that could be considered bad, like mothballs, for example, the factory my father worked at where they washed feathers and filled them into cushions. They were, you know, using mothballs quite heavily, but it's got this romantic sort of connection for me because for a, t for a while he also was like the caretaker of the building of the factory and we lived in an apartment close by which sounds bad but it wasn't because it was connected to a lot of greenery around and we could go into the large storage halls like after they closed down and rollerblade around and it was a bit it sounds a bit surreal but we, the most ball smell I really love and basmati rice cooking that sort of powdery smell I love that um and cardamom always, um, right now in Berlin, lilacs up in bloom, bonfire, um, fire. And a fire in India also smells a bit different than a fire here. Like the skin of guavas, I think I also put this in the book. I really like that. Me guava too. I love, oh. I love a ripe guava. There's a grocery store by me that always has them. And I just kind of walk through the aisle and inhale deeply sometimes. Oh, uh, yeah. And then, yeah, sort of these memories connected to, like, I think I was dancing in a bar in London. It was 10 years ago, and there was a girl, and she was really cool, and she smelled really good, and I asked her what perfume she's wearing. She gave me the tester, and I kept it forever. It was a tuberose, I think, Frederick Mel candle flower, and I, it was so, it's far too heavy, but it was so, yeah, it, it's just if, if, if the scent is connected to a situation and time in your life. I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, it could go on forever. <laughs> I love this conversation around food and memory. I recently interviewed a food scientist, Dr. Ariel Johnson, on the podcast, and she told me that the part of your brain that processes scent is kind of snuggled up right next to the, pro the part of your brain that holds memory, and that's kind of this scientific reason as to why the two are so entwined. Um, but I think also just if you're somebody that loves sensation, like it's easy for your brain to remember something that how something smelled or tasted in that moment and just kind of connect it to emotions as well which is so cool absolutely and as i said before uh also including sort of bad smells or really strong smells and that like i worked with an artist who interviewed an artist isabel lewis who worked with a sort of scent artist she's quite renowned Cecil tolas and they try to sort of capture the scent of for example Burkheim or science, <laughs> like very abstract ideas, like so sweat and and she gave me a sample that was so strong. I had to keep it wrapped in plastic in my post box, but then the whole ha hallway sort of <laughs> smelled of the Burkheim scent, which was very intense. And so yeah, yeah what really was, followed me. What was the Burkheim scent? Was it like sweat and a sweat, dirt. alcohol, meal molecules, smoke, dirt. Yeah, Poppers, all that. It was amazing, <laughs> but it was also very, yeah, strong. That's so interesting. When I was talking with Ariel, I was asking her about people who like the smell of gasoline, for example, which I think is also a very potent and maybe some people would say a bad smell. And she was just saying that, you know, maybe you've 
had positive experiences in a car before. It's a scent that you smelled mm. a lot growing up. But I think it also might be just how, you know, some people like are predisposed to not like cilantro. Like maybe some people just have the gene that gasoline really, really gets them going or something. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so possible. speaking of this kind of like tension between good and bad experiences, it makes me think about the radish farm that Happy comes to at the end of the book in Europe, which is, you know, a really kind of brutal setting for him to be in. They don't have a lot of access to, you know, heat in the winter or food or all of these things. But it also is marked by these moments of joy, like the scrappy caravan kitchen that the migrant farmers set up for themselves. I'm curious about why you decided to include that as a scene. Like, how did you want to be sharing the struggle of the farmers and also this kind of moments of resiliency or even the kind of farms like Bari, Kama that you mentioned at the end and the acknowledgements? I think I wanted to create a moment where the idea of coming together, building something out of a community could shine through, even if it's not fully realized in the end. And if in the end it is not possible, because it mostly isn't. Arikama, this initiative by Malinese farmers who left these exploitative working conditions to do their own thing, form a cooperative and sell their own produce on markets in Rome, do their own yogurt. That's such an amazing story, um, which was also born out of a real life uprising. I think in 2010 it was um, when there was sort of racist assaults against some of the workers in the south of Italy, in the town they lived locally. And then there was this whole thing, and which resulted in them actually, you know, finding a solution and autonomy, um, which is what you don't have because um, the way it's portrayed, because it also mirrors my research, I, it is so, um, uh, you know, very strongly connected to mafia ties, the whole food industry, um, the caporelato, the the whole system of, you know, food uh, work and especially uh, vegetables and fruits um, in Italy. And it's so hard to, to really get through and research. And uh, people have to be quite mindful of the security, those people working uh, in these areas. And so... Um, you, you don't know what's happening to you, you know, that's why the people organizing stuff are just called the coordinators, sort of faceless, nameless. Um, because also, I mean, the real life conditions are often far bleaker than they are even in the book. Um, and then there are some that, you know, are livable and there are people who go on to build a life and there are Punjabi, North Indian communities um, in Italy, where, you know, it, it, it has changed a lot over the past 20 years, but then some weather conditions are remain just as bleak. And so there's a whole spectrum of um, stories that went into it and a change is possible, as you can see in Barikama, but it's so rare. So, and the caravan kitchen is just a little light, just a little me imagining how it would be if, you know, it was just a little idea of how could it be, if how could it work out for them? You know, what could be the beginning of autonomy and doing their own thing? Yeah, it's agency also for them, especially as people who don't have, you know, they're working with food that's being sent out to other people and then they have pretty little control over what they can actually be eating themselves. And I think that to be able to cook the food that you want to eat, maybe not everything you want to eat because the access to the ingredients is still quite limited, is actually like quite a powerful moment of like self-actualization for people, certainly in the book. Exactly. How do you cook your home food if you don't have the ingredients or even the shops? And when I grew up in Western Germany, like in small town in the uh, 90s, there was no Indian food store yet in the town we lived in. So we went to London, to Tharsal, to do our big Indian food shopping and big packs of basmati rice. And so, and exactly, that's the old story of working in the food industry and producing delectable consumer goods that you yourself cannot consume. Yeah. Do you find yourself um, thinking about, you know, grocery shopping or going to restaurants differently now that you've written this book? 
Oh, you know what? That's that's an interesting question because there are always times when I, you know, we order food boxes like from cooperatives, um, like vegetable and fruit. And um, before my daughter was born, to try to cook more locally, of course, because that's always like the solution. But then uh, you have times when you are low on money, <laughs> you don't have a big budget, and then you go back to shopping at maybe discounters, and you know, you know, and you just look at where is your radish from, where is your orange from, and um, and yeah, so it's it's a different, it's a constant struggle, and I'm definitely I'm more mindful, but I'm definitely one of those people who managed to really uh, eat radically locally, and um, even sort of don't eat pepper because it's you know not grown locally or something. Because there are restaurants who work like that, which is amazing, and but um, definitely it makes you more mindful. Because if you think about it every single time, you actually can't buy it. <laughs> like, you know? Yeah. Um, but that's the thing. We, as with meat and everything else, we so often it's, it's just a collective suppression um, because we're so used to it. And then sometimes when there, for instance, in our local supermarket recently, there was, I think, the fridge or the Kühlhouse, the large fridge was broken. So the vegetable and fruit section was almost entirely empty. And I'm like, what's happening here? Like, I can't get this and that and, you know, my daughter's favorite foods. So you feel like immediately enraged and puzzled and how can this be, you know, but that's actually, you should, ex we should experience that far more often. Um, Definitely. It's always yeah. interesting to try to make good choices in an imperfect system. I find myself, you know, in the grocery store debating, oh, is my local meat better or worse than the tofu made from soybeans grown halfway around the world. I find that like mm. consumers are the people that are trying to make these impossible calculations when really like the larger corporations are probably not thinking about it at all. And certainly when you don't have access to something, you think about it more. I used to work at a, a grocery co-op here in Brooklyn and uh, mm. I would stock the vegetables on the Saturday afternoon shift, which is easily the busiest time in the grocery store. And whenever we would run out of broccoli, there would be like a riot. And I didn't realize that <laughs> so many people ate broccoli until this happened. And I had to be answering about why there wasn't any broccoli that day. And and then now I like I can never buy broccoli again because I'm worried that um, if I take it that, you know, someone else is going to have their whole day ruined. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely love that. And I mean, we both, I think, live in places like Brooklyn and here, maybe Kreuzberg or Neukölln, where you have a lot of mindful, healthy people, um, you know, doing the right choices. And then, you know, but and then are also some people who are quite smug about it and think they're better than people who don't. And then there's this whole thing about class coming into it. And yeah. so, yeah, it's, it's a whole big thing. And then there's broccoli that's not there. And then you're furious. So. Yeah. Selena, <laughs> Emotional. We, could talk, we could talk all day about the grocery co-op politics, but there, there's like, you know, people try to ban sugar and people try to ban plastic or meat, like all of these things from the co-op. And then other people, the co-op are saying, the mission of the co-op is to be providing affordable food for people. So even if you don't want to eat sugar, that doesn't mean that like someone else in the community <laughs> doesn't want to get it for less. But um, you like go to one of the meetings and it's just kind of fascinating to think about like not only the choices that people make, but the choices that they want to make for other people. That's so amazing. Have you written about this? I want to read this piece I have about not. the co-op. I have not. It's <laughs> been should. very well documented because I would recommend <laughs> Hannah Goldfield wrote a great piece for The New Yorker about the Park Slope Food Co-op, which is the one that okay, I'm great. referring to. And I would love for you to read it because it has like so many fascinating stories about the dynamics of this one specific co-op. <laughs> I think, isn't there a scene in Ben Lerner uh, where he also was sort of sorting oranges at the co-op? Co yeah, it was, I don't know. it was definitely yeah. this co-op. I'll link to it in the show notes for the podcast also. Um, I guess talking about like specific Brooklyn moments, I'm curious about Berlin food scene. I haven't spent a lot of time there. I would love to. How would you describe the kind of food scene in the city in this moment? And maybe what are one of your favorite like non-sandwich places to go to? Oh, the food scene in Berlin. I think it like it's constantly evolving, of course. And I'm not sure whether I'm in a position to describe the scene itself. I think it it's the same things you encounter in other places too. Same power dynamics, gentrification, still in need of more female chefs, diversity, etc. And it's it's, it's evolved so much in the time of this great openness when new stuff in Berlin could happen easily and, you know, maybe cheaper than anywhere else. It's definitely over. And there are great collectives like Smells Like and like Kavita Milu and the people who did the Street Food Thursday at Mark Talanoi and who 
significantly contributed to the diversity of the food landscape in Berlin over the past sort of 20 years. Something I could eat all the time is chunking noodles in Reichenberger Straße, Dutchy Diner School um, in Nice for Lunch, closer to where I live now in, in another part of town. Love Deluxe I talked about. Um, definitely recommend that for brunch. And I do love it's something typically Berlin, maybe a boulette. It's a Berlin meatball. Uh, in the rest of Germany, it's called Frikadelle. Um, I used to be vegetarian for 10 years. I should go back, but still I have, you know, I love a good boulette, sort of old-fashioned Berlin style. I'll and... have to try that. I feel like when I was <laughs> yeah. in Berlin, I only had like post-club donor, which was great, but specific, or like curry verse, you <laughs> <Well>, know? <laughs> that's really good too, of course. Um, it's specific. But... <laughs> <laughs> I still remember. It's been a while for me, the post clap dinner, but I'm now you talking about it. Yeah, definitely. You can just um, light your, your Burkheim. You can spritz your Burkheim scent and then just go eat it and it'll be easier. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Just skip it before and be awake. And, and there's like, there's one Tibetan restaurant in Berlin where basically my life happened. I think uh, where I took dates, ended relationships, cried, they met my family. <laughs> and I went there for the first time to find momos after after I returned from India in 2010. It might not be the very best Tibetan restaurant in the world, but it's called Tibet House. It's in Kreuzberg and it's just a place like home. Um, so yeah, that's that's my Berlin food scene moments. Um, well, I love with no that. guarantee of completeness. <laughs> <laughs> I love Momo, so it's good to know where to get Momo's the next yeah. time I'm in Berlin. Mm -hmm. And to close the episode today, I want to play a little like rapid fire taste check with you. So I'll give you a category and you can just tell me the first answer that pops into your head. Okay. 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 Favorite cookbook. Mm, so we had a cookbook from the 80s. I don't know the author. I don't know the name. But he had all these glistening, overly saturated food photography <laughs> and recipes for traditional dishes and like ratatouille or moussaka. And I remember looking at it and just thinking, oh, my God. And I always wanted to eat these very traditional dishes because we grew up on Punjabi cooking, old school organic food or like instant sort of super weird mix and not a lot of sort of savoir vivre as I wanted it. And I remember on a camp, camping holiday how we tried to cook an artichoke, I think, as described in this cookbook. And we didn't know how and we didn't know which parts of the artichoke to eat. And it was really funny. And um, yeah, so this old fashioned cookbook, I don't know whether my mother still had it. I love that. I have to interrupt the rapid fire to say that my family has a legend about um, eating artichoke in the 60s in California um, when it was first <laughs> becoming available. And my mom's aunt came to town from the East Coast and she was very mm -hmm. proud of being East Coast. She thought that the California family was maybe a little country. And so they served artichokes and they said to her, do you know how to eat an artichoke? And she kind of sniffed and said, oh, of course I know how to eat an artichoke. So everyone, you know, went around eating the leaves. And then when it came time for the artichoke heart, she just very carefully scraped off the fuzz like everybody else and then popped it on a spoon and ate it. And nobody said anything to her because they all were <laughs> angry that she had thought that she was better than them. <laughs> <laughs> That's so amazing. I love that. So it's a common I experience. <laughs> Okay. That's wonderful. Your favorite non cookbook food book? Oh my God, that's so hard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's so hard. You know, mm, no, I don't I don't have a good good answer for that because um because I have a lot of like books for children I read where there were great food descriptions, but that's not a food book. You so can, that, I, I you can say that. That would count. <laughs> It is really like famous five. It's so bad. Like as a child, they have such vivid food descriptions of British food, which is actually, I think, if you, if I would have tasted it quite bad, like <laughs> they talk of buttery crumpets and like cream and, and, and it was, it was sounded so luscious. And I know, funnily enough, it was a thing. It's a thing in India where, and there it's connected to the whole colonizers literature thing where, um, you know, basically a lot of children also love Famous Five for the food descriptions. But then when you try it the first time, it's not as good as in the book. But I adore the food descriptions, yeah, and Famous Five. I love that. I had the similar experience uh, with Turkish Delight and um, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I thought it was going to be like my favorite thing in the world, and then it just wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, your favorite bookstore? Um... 
so ah, oh, like in Berlin or everywhere in the world. Mm, you could do one <laughs> of each if you really can't decide. Um, so when I was in New York, I was blown away by McNally Jackson Soho, and I really liked Molasses books in Williamsburg too, and um. In Berlin, I like Hopscotch Reading Room, and she said books. They're amazing. Um, and I liked a reading room I went to in Delhi. It was connected to gallery, a contemporary art gallery. I forgot the name, but I worked there way back on my bachelor's thesis. And I love this little, I love reading rooms, you know, mm -hmm. when it's sort of curated and you're not overwhelmed. And, you know, you have this selection that you can work with and a private atmosphere. Mm. Okay, your favorite Berlin bar. Ah. Uh, Berlin bar so because it's been a while since I've frequented bars so often they're amazing bars of course but for now I would have a drink on you know the top of KDV it's this old-fashioned department store and have a food section and you know where old ladies used to have a little zip of Cremant Champagne and you have and I, I like this mix of people and I like and you know I do have to have a, to have a drink there mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, a restaurant anywhere in the world that you wish could be your neighborhood restaurant. Oh, yes, I have one. That's Eatable Archives in India. And then now they do have a restaurant in Goa. They work with indigenous ingredients, sort of ancient rice varieties that are on the brink of extinction. And I wish I could eat their pomelo salad and perfect lemon or mango rice with bindi every day. I'd be a better person. They now... You know, they were part of the Kuti Biennale in Kerala. It's an art event every two years. Um, and I was there for a workshop for a while. And everyone who worked there, all the artists, the guests, they all came to eat at their temporary setup. Their chef is called Anomitra Ghosh. I would really, I would go to Goa just for a day to eat there. It's the best. They're mm. amazing. It sounds great. And finally, a fictional food scene from a book or a movie that you wish you could eat. You know, I, I probably, that's, that's hard. I'd probably also, that one of the things would be the famous five, the, the children's book sceneries. And then also going back as a child, again, um, I, you know, watching The Beauty and the Beast and the, <laughs> and the feast that is put in front of her, probably that. It's a childhood, you know, going back to childhood memories and eating everything I wanted to eat then. Because back then it was about imagining all the things that I didn't have at my fingertips at the time. So they were so wild and amazing. <laughs> yeah, I also think there's something about animated food that it just looks extra good. You kind of just need to try it. <laughs> Absolutely. The perfect idea of food is like, yeah, it's just. Well, that's great. Thank you so much, Selena, for coming on the podcast. It was so fun to talk with you. Thank you so much. It was amazing. I could have gone on forever. This is Taste is hosted by Matt Rodbard and me, Eliza Abarbanel. The show is produced by Shalia Harris and Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. Theme music by Steve Rydell. Visit Taste online at tastecooking.com and make sure to subscribe to our newsletter for updates on all cool things happening.